Hello, hello everyone. Hopefully everyone's well fed and nourished. Um, we've got a fantastic lineup coming up now. So we'll kick it off with uh, Mr. Pip Jenkinson. So Pip works in, um, for Biden Solutions. So Biden Solutions is a information security and technical solutions firm serving both state and federal government and also private enterprises in Australia. Based in Queensland, he proudly he they are proudly Indigenous owned, reinvesting into their local community, regional communities, and help to bridge that gap that we have um, in IT. Um, personally, from on personal note, I think this is absolutely fantastic initiative, and I think it's one that we need a lot more of. So I'm very, very much looking forward to to hear from Pip, who's going to talk around Indigenous and and and, and ICT. Well, without further ado, we'll bring Pip to the stage. And you don't want to see me anymore. Bye. Okay, guys. Um, can you? Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Um, this is the first time I've done this uh, on on this. Any mistakes that I make, uh, I'm just going to try and do the very best I can. Um, okay, so I was um, asked to speak on on this subject. This subject is very uh, dear to, to to my heart. Um, um, I'll just give you a, uh, an understanding of where this where this drive comes from because it is it is a little bit un, unusual for a, a non-Indigenous man to be as passionate about this as, as I am. Um, uh, about two years ago, uh, my dad um, uh, passed away. He was married to my mum for 56 years. Um, he he, he um, produced three beautiful boys. Uh, we all stayed out of jail, so I think he's done a very good job there. Um, but for all the wonderful things that he, he was, he was also a smoker. Um, and so it came to no surprise that uh, dad passed away from stage four lung cancer. Uh, about two years ago. And one of the things that dad drove home to the three boys um, was this concept of legacy. Son, leave the world in a better place than when, when you found it. And, and um, you know, I was really passionate about IT security. I've been involved in the industry for 10 years. Uh, and, and like, you know, an event where something as cataclysmic as a parent passing away, it really caused me to stop and just have a little bit of a, a sanity check and introspection of what I was doing in the industry and, and why, you know, a way I could be responsible of, of creating a positive legacy. And I started on this journey of, of um, it was just before the World Cup, and we started on the journey of, of, of being able to rattle off with relative uninterruption um, notable First Nations sporting stars. Right? And it was, it, was across the, it was across the board. It wasn't just rugby union, it's Kurt Le Beal. Uh, it was it was rugby league and it was AFL and it was tennis and it was you know you start looking into it and there's, there's horse racing and there's darts champions. Then I started to extrapolate that out and looked at music and, and, and activism and politics and education and law. And I could find instances of really, really cool First Nations, not just at a at a at a representation, but at an international standard. And then I came to look at my own industry. Um, and I was really ashamed to say that after 10 years of working in, in, in IT security, um, both from a vendor and a reseller, uh, and having touched um, some, some fairly large accounts in federal and state government, that I couldn't name an Indigenous pen tester or First Nations stock manager. Uh, Laurie, I, I know you're on the, uh, on, the, on the call. I hope what I tell you, you can identify with. I couldn't name until uh, finding Laurie an Indigenous CISO. Um, let alone a CIO, and, and I thought that, you know, thankfully my ignorance has been lifted and now I can name um, and identify men and women uh, who identify as being First Nations in, in, our, in our sector. And I just think there needs to be more of them. I, don't, I think that uh, our society and our, our, our industry um, needs to work harder at producing these role models. So with that as a, as a backdrop of to why I'm talking about what I'm talking about, then I'll, um, I'll crack on. So. Uh, in keeping with the theme, uh, kryptonite for me is is uh, barriers to Indigenous inclusion and diversity in IT security. I'm going to keep it short and sharp and punchy. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to limit it to to nine slides. So rather than listen to gender and just read off my powerpoints, there's going to be lots of lots of talking. I'm going to try and keep my eye on the on the chat screen. So if there is a question, please um, type it in. Or if you allow me to to rattle through this, I'll I'll answer all the questions uh, at at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation. So 
I just want to ask you, you uh, men and women on the on the call, uh, like, do you guys think that we have a problem? I mean, I certainly do, but but I've done a bit of research on this. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I've got some answers, and I wanted to ask you um, if we had a had a problem. And a way that I've articulated this in the past is is just to ask yourself this question, right? And and I get you to do it virtually, but could you just stop for a moment and think of an indigenous Right, that you can name and picture the face. And for those of you who can't think of an Indigenous sports star, I'll just throw a name out there, Ash Barty or, or Anthony Mundine um, or, or Jonathan Thurston. Okay, so now we've got that picture of that, that smiling face in our brain. Well, I'm going to virtually ask you to put both hands in the air and say, right, now keep your hands in the air if you can think of an Indigenous man or woman who you've worked with in IT who identifies as being First Nations. And I'd ask you, everyone on the call to ask themselves the same question, except now if we can think of IT being the dark, security being the bullseye, ask yourself this, now, how many um, men and women have you bumped into in your career, or even over the last 12 months, that have identified as being First Nations in IT security? And, and I think, and I'm happy to be challenged on this, but I, I think that the answers will be, will be in single digits, if not zero. And, and so I think that there is a problem. Um, so yeah, we've got a problem. And the problem comes from um, what we've just played out there, stereotypes, right? Pigeonholing First Nations men and women into sport is a very, very dangerous um, uh, pigeonhole. And, and it, it, starts to, um, it starts to put these um, beautifully talented and creative human beings into little pigeonholes of what they can and can't do to be successful. And sport certainly is, is one of those ones. Um, and it's a, it's a problem that the US is experiencing um, over there as well. It's, and it's something that we need to be conscious and cognizant of addressing here in Australia. Um, so workplace culture, lack of role models, supply diversity, I'll, I'll pull these apart in a moment. Financial constraints, educational gaps, uh, reliable access to technology, um, ignorance, um, supply chain diversity, or sorry, supply chain consolidation, and fear. We've touched on um, stereotypes. Workplace culture is a big one, and uh, reconciliation action plans, which I'll which I'll ex extrapolate on a little bit on this call, um, is definitely a barrier to inclusion. Um, uh, certainly, there are uh, some some um, sectors in in uh, in the workplace, or, or some um, some categories in the workplace where, where First Nations men and women feel more welcome than, than, than others. Um, and to, by, by consulting with traditional owners uh, on Nukum Bear land um, and Yagar and Turrbal, where, where, where I live, um, we can identify that some of those work, those workplaces are the traditional, um, or what would be referred to as, as uh, traditional uh, Indigenous um, occupations, things like um, arts, arts, and uh, uh, tourism, and uh, hospitality, and um, you know cultural events, and indeed sports. So we have to really work hard around the culture that we're exuding to the to potential employees. A lack of role models. Um, so we're bouncing around town saying that we want to create the first JT of IT. Um, I bumped into a, a wonderful uh, young lady in procurement recently, and she asked me why I was so focused on creating the first Justin. Timberlake of, of, of IT, and I said, no, 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 it was the, it was the, wrong, it was the wrong JT. Um, the reason why we wanted to pick that man out in particular was that there is a guy that represents everything that's wholesome and good about sport, culture, um, mob, um, business, philanthropy, um, looking after um, his children, looking after his family, clean living, identity choices, all of these things that personified in this pinup boy uh, for aspiring Indigenous sports stars. Who do you want to be like when you grow up? Well, I want to be like JT. I want to be like Mark Ella. I want to be like Sammy Thado. And I think that um, with the exception of a couple of people on this call specifically here, um, that there is a distinct lack of role models at that, at that uh, CISO level. Um, supply diversity, which is really important because um, if, if we, if we, if we if we don't diversify our supply chain, then it's sort of like the million dollar question. How, how, can, we, how can we encourage it to be perceived as being an inclusive sector when our supply chain is literally um, you know, either, either all white or uh, there are no women-owned business or there's no veterans business. I'm a, I'm a veteran myself and uh, 
perhaps there's no uh, Australian uh, disability enterprise businesses in your supply chain. So it's not just about Indigenous, but for the purpose of today's conversation, it certainly will be. Uh, financial constraints is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, um, we understand that, that, that what makes a candidate, or sorry, what can make a candidate particularly attractive for employment in, in a SOC team are these international certifications. Uh, I can assure you after paying for a number of them, they are not cheap. And I put it to you guys that, um, that a, a SANS incident response handling course, which would make um, any graduate, but if we're just going to focus on Indigenous graduates, an Indigenous graduate from university who then has a, a, a SANS incident response handling course under her wing would make her more attractive for employment. Uh, so there is a financial constraint that, that, that uh, I think our industry plays a lot of importance on those C acronyms, and anything from ASARCA and anything from SANS. Uh, educational gaps, so the, the two are linked there the, between um, the industry uh, and the certifications uh, and what we're asking of our graduates when they come through uni or through TAFE or from high school. We're asking them to, to know more, to, to be more certified. Um, access to technology, um, so certainly um, out west, um, uh, you know, in, in remote regional communities across Australia, um, there is a there is a, a barrier to, to, to this uh, idea about you know, regular uninterrupted internet. Now, I certainly can't um, I can't provide a solution for that. In, in fact, the three things that I want to speak about today um, were were um, financial constraints, educational constraints, and, and social constraints. There's a little bit of ignorance there around um, um, you know what I think people in general um, uh, can do and um, supply chain consolidation. And, and, and this is working very closely with chief procurement officers and understanding that what these um, men and women are taught at university um, and what we are proposing around supply chain diversity, it's almost, um, uh, it's sort of a, like a, a, a flip of the coin where we where we would traditionally think that supply chain co consolidation is all about cost savings, uh, reducing risk um, and providing benefits for the organisation. Uh, counter that with um, supplier diversity, um, which is also about uh, being a more corporately responsible citizen, um, being more representative of the community in which we operate, that we support. And, and the final one for me is fear. And um, this is my opinion, and, and I'm happy to, to be challenged on it uh, in a nice way. Um, please don't be mean. That sometimes I think, having done this for a little while, um, Sometimes I think that there is a general fear in the community and in, in corporate and, and um, private sector. The fear of saying the wrong thing paralyzes people to say nothing at all. Or, or the fear of doing the wrong thing and being reprimanded paralyzes people from doing anything at all. And I think that that paralysis is almost as, as bad as, as the, you know, what was going to be said. And the way it was described to me was that if something is said or something is done and it's coming from um, sort of a, a, a point of, of uneducation or, or, or benevolent ignorance, um, it's not as bad as just sort of sticking your head in the sand and pretending that we don't have a problem and, and, uh, and there's a fear of putting your hand up to say, listen, boss, I don't agree with that. Can we do something different? Um, that's that's what I mean about fear. So is it a, I mean, is it really a problem in Australia in you know IT C security in 2020? And we just bring you back to that original statement um, that I have done before, both here in Queensland and and down in, in Melbourne in large audiences where we where we we just play that um, little game about you know, identifying men and women who we've worked with. So yeah, I, I mate, I think it's uh, it absolutely is. Um, and there are two main reasons, um, um, it's social and, and economic. So the advantages of, of, of what we're talking about are not just the warm, fuzzy feelings that we get from, from doing something that is fair, you know, just and, and morally correct. Um, you know, ask any of the, the, the CEOs of a, an ASX listed organisation and they'll be proudly beating, beating chests and saying, yeah, yeah we're, we're all about creating diverse organisations. Um, you know, they, they might point to their inclusion policy or the diverse people in their workplace and support of local communities. Um, you know, indeed, three out of the, the Fortune 500 companies now employ a chief diversity officer. Um, 
but there remains a critical area that, that every organisation needs to focus, focus on, and, and, and it, um, it's their supply chain. Um, over the last few years, supply diversity has gained a significant amount of traction um, to become one of the, the largest trends in enterprise uh, procurement. And this is reflected in some of the stuff that we're seeing, um, having worked closely with Supply Nation and Reconciliation uh, Action Plans Australia, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So organisations like, um, and, and it's not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, uh, there are thousands of organisations that do this, but you know, the, the big four banks, um, Rio, BHP, Flight Centre, uh, Bank of Queensland, you know, some of the vendors who are, are sharing this call with us now are looking at all this. But they've made massive investments in supply diversity. Um, because I think today's organisations need to think a little bit differently about their supply chain. Um, procurement, corporate social responsibility programs, and how the three are intricately interwoven. Apologies. I believe that those who do this and, and pay attention to CSR programs will have an opportunity to change the world in ways that you know, our predecessors um, could, could, couldn't have never have imagined. Uh, and, and I also believe that those that don't change um, will be left behind. Excuse me, just whilst I um, blow my nose. Uh, I don't have COVID. Simply understood, supply diversity is about your supply chain and the supplies that constitute this chain. And in, in, to achieve supply diversity, Organisations must be accepting and open to changing their supply chain to make it more inclusive. And an inclusive supply chain just doesn't start and stop with Indigenous business. Um, we, we'd be talking about certainly Indigenous-owned businesses. Um, we'd also be talking about women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, Australian disability enterprise-owned businesses, and indeed social enterprises. Um, and why is it important that we focus on these guys? Well, I think it's quite simple. These businesses are typically disadvantaged for being different. Um, they can be discriminated against because of their differences. But by supporting these organisations, there's a valuable opportunity to promote growth of local communities to strengthen the economy and to provide more opportunities for individuals uh, and businesses and indeed the nation to grow uh, and, and prosper. Um, so, so there, that's that's what's at risk if we do nothing. And I think that if we do something, the the advantages are, are pretty um, uh, are pretty compelling. So, uh, a lot of people sit back and and uh, and wait for the government to do something. It's um, uh, but after have working very closely with the government when we when we kicked this um, this business off, uh, we flew down and spoke to to some ministers and the. Um, Refreshingly, the, the, the uniform feedback to, to us um, when we flew down as a consortium to talk about Indigenous business was the government's role was to be a better customer. And indeed, there was a quote there from the then Cyber Minister. Um, if we want to transform the entrepreneurial or digital government sector in Australia, the most important thing we can do is to be a better customer. Um, you know, I, I believe that the government's role is to is to embrace the federally mandated procurement policies and to enforce at a state level those state-based procurement objectives. And then for individuals within those state-based organisations and federally based organisations, their role is to enlighten themselves and to be accountable. And if look, if no one else is looking, just be accountable to yourself. This is the right thing to do on 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 on, on so many levels. Um, it's not just enterprises that are putting the spotlight on supply diversity. The Commonwealth Government is, has made massive leaps um, of supply chain diversity through the IPP, through the Indigenous Procurement Policy. Um, the Government has set to, to or, sorry, has set its sights to achieve 3% of every government goods and services uh, to be consumed through an Indigenous business by 2020. And, to ensure that there is a tangible change to, to supply diversity from a government perspective, those targets are enforceable. Um, the IPP sets out to create opportunities for, for Indigenous businesses to grow, to drive demand for goods and services provided by Indigenous businesses, to boost employment, to stimulate new investment into Indigenous businesses. And then there are the, the, the sometimes the things that we don't think about as a sector, and they're the things like 
creating intergenerational wealth. So wealth that's handed down through the generations. Uh, opportunity employment pathways for kids to follow as they leave uni and they're looking around to potential career opportunities and starting to look at IT security as a viable career pathway. Um, and, 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 and I think that there is a, a, you know, a great responsibility that the government has. And I also think that by leading by example, um, it's showing that Indigenous, sorry, it's showing that by including Indigenous businesses uh, in your supply chain can bring around so many benefits. Um, the IPP not only demonstrates right purchasing behaviours from organisations that have a significant amount of money to, um, to push down through the supply chain, but it also sends a very powerful message to corporate Australia. Um, and, and I believe that that message is that if all businesses get behind the Australian government's grow, uh, goal, then the markets will grow, our uh, economy will thrive, um, and, and we will start to see, um, and it certainly won't happen overnight, and I'm not proposing that there's going to be a tsunami, but there will be a trickle uh, which will grow into a, uh, a flood of capable Indigenous uh, men and women um, that, will, that will provide those role models for, for, other, for other kids to follow. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, the difference between the two slides, between private and uh, public, uh, there's not a great deal of difference. And I think the private sector needs to be a better customer. Uh, I think the private sector needs to embrace reconciliation action plans, not just as a tick box. So not just saying I've got a plan, but what is the, what am I going to do with that plan? Um, how am I going to use reconciliation action and all those supporting frameworks uh, that reconciliation action plans provide? How am I going to use those for good? Um, how am I going to enforce procurement objectives that support social outcomes? And then from an individual level, how can I educate myself as a private sector uh, employee or, or someone who buys or procures uh, ITC security um, goods and services? How can I educate myself and be accountable to not only my business, but also my customers and the community that, that my business operates in? Um, our community is diverse. Our customers are diverse. So let's make other parts of the, 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 the corporate structure diverse. Um, I think that's, um, that's, that's, that's really important. Um, I'm, I'm going to steal a quote from the chairperson of Supply Nation. Um, Supply Nation, by the way, is a, is a not-for-profit organisation with the purpose of providing opportunities for small to medium enterprise Indigenous businesses to enter into commercial relationships with large corporate and government entities. Um, Indigenous businesses certified with Supply Nation can, can get a lot of support from this organisation. And as the chairperson of Supply Nation told a newspaper, we educate procurement officers to broaden their minds. Now, if they need high-vis workwear, security services, or everyday purchases like paper, we absolutely have a business, an Indigenous-owned business, that we can point you in the direction of. Uh, and that then opens up, you know, the, the, the sort of the idea that Indigenous businesses are not uh, homogenous and they're not always about culture, uh, community or sport. Um, they're entrepreneurial, they're pioneering, they're innovative. They're, they, come, um, they come with a different way of looking at a, at a, at a problem, you know, the, uh, old problem, new sets of eyes. So I think this idea about, um, you know, and I, and, I, and I keep labouring on the point about supply diversity, supply diversity, supply diversity, because whilst... Batum Solutions represents Queensland's first and only uh, Supply Nation certified IT security consultancy. There, there must be 50 or 60 non-Indigenous IT security consultancies. And so I'm proposing that if the, if the sector in Queensland can support those 60 and one of ours, then it, it, it just goes to show that, well, there should be 10 of us. There should be 10 Indigenous businesses in Queensland all, all competing. Um, for for these projects and 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 hopefully putting back into the community. Um, the other thing that I wanted to to, to talk to you about uh, uh, and to give you some education around uh, another way of overcoming some of these barriers or, or kryptonite to what we're trying to do around diversity inclusion are reconciliation action plans. Now I'm fairly certain that we're all con uh, uh, conscious of the concept of. Um, an ISO certification framework is, is simply a, a framework for the way that the organisation holds information. Well, reconciliation action plan is, is, is simple yet incredibly powerful. 
It outlines the steps an organisation will need to take to build strong relationships and, and respect. That's the key word there, respect, between non-Indigenous people and, and First Nations Australians. And it, 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 it lays down a framework for tangible social change. Um, in fact, a, a recent report shows that reconciliation action plans are helping to close the gap in employment between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. A RAP plan, um, and I'll share the links with you at the end of this speech, but uh, the RAP plan helps to create more dynamic and diverse workplace, which, which is a more understanding and therefore more tolerant and different, uh, different of, you know, tolerant of different cultures, uh, which can only be a good thing for, for Australia, right? If, if we're just a more tolerant in, in, in our workplace. And I think that ICT will start to present itself as a more inclusive environment for First Nations participation. So what's the bloody solution to all this kryptonite talk? Um, because I, I, I do find that a lot of people talk um, and there's not a lot of action. And, and that's why I, a couple of slides ago, we sort of, we, we, we had a quick chat about um, sometimes people wait for the government to mandate something uh, and then we'll do it. Now, please don't be that person that waits for something to be mandated before it becomes bloody common sense. The same concept about getting in your car and putting your seatbelt on because it's common sense. That's where we want to get to, and it's going to need it's going to need a, a combined effort of, of everybody in the sector, from from the reseller to the vendor that we represent, to the customers, to the disties. We all need to come together and act as act as these superheroes for diversity and inclusion. Um, in keeping with the theme, we can all be superheroes, and yes, we can. We can all be superheroes if we just do the little things right. We don't need to. Um, you know, rattle the cage and put our employment at risk by, you know, challenging the, the status quo. But certainly from our perspective, um, as being an, an innovative uh, partner to state and federal government and the ASX Top 100, uh, we know only full well that we are challenging the status quo uh, in, in procurement and in, in technical teams. Um, but it's just really wonderful when customers and decision makers just give us a go because that in my mind is being a superhero it's just saying we'll give you a go and we won't assess you on your culture or the culture of the people you represent we will assess you on your capability uh, and i think that is is what what we all want as human beings just to be assessed on our capability whether you're black or white gay or straight uh, um, regardless of your religious beliefs just can you do the job that we're being asked of you? Yes. Is it within the budget envelope? Yes. Do you have all the appropriate uh, insurances and, and uh, that we need to to give ourselves some 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 uh, some comfort that you guys can can cover us? Yes, we can. Do you have some references? Yes. Well, then instead of instead of asking why Indigenous business to provide the outcome, I'd kind of flip it on its head and I'd say, well, perhaps we should be asking ourselves as a sector, why not? Like, why not? The government's leading the way, and in some in some of their procurement policies, cert, certainly from a New South Wales government perspective uh, and a Victorian government perspective, in black and white, it's in the procurement policy that is re, is reported on at a state based level to say services that can, that you're after as a procurement professional. If the certain goods and services can be found from an Indigenous business first, then you don't need to test the market. In fact, you're, you're well within your rights to start commercial negotiations with that Indigenous supplier. Now think about that for a moment, about this idea about in IT security getting, and from a CISO's perspective and a CIO's perspective, getting the security control that you want today to fix the problem that exists today not in three months time once a testing the market process has happened and once we've evaluated three quotes from 15 different suppliers, we want a control to fit. Now, there aren't many organisations in Australia that can effectively navigate some of the procurement um, processes whilst supporting and encouraging probity every step of the way. There aren't too many organisations that can do this that are welcome with open arms in state and federal government 
um, other than Indigenous business providers um, of goods and services. And in this instance, we're talking about security. So in my mind, growing up as a, as a, as a young boy, in my mind, um, superheroes were always supportive, uh, kind, patient, knowledgeable, and just like Clark Kent, they did the right thing even when no one was looking. So I firmly believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, that in many years to come, we will have an IT sector that is so supportive of Indigenous inclusion and diversity that many of the superheroes that have picked up the challenge today, and I hope that many of you do, will pass on that cape and mask to the next generation of superheroes. So we get to a stage uh, where this idea about diversity and inclusion doesn't take a cognitive thought process. It just happens. I think that would be a, a wonderful place uh, for us all to, to be. Um, I, for those of you who are interested, I, I can share. Uh, sorry, that, that concludes the, the formal process of, of, the, uh, of the chat. Um, I wanted to share some links with you, uh, if you are interested, links to Supply Nation and what that organisation represents to reconciliation.org.au, um, uh, uh, certainly from a, a, um, uh, a state-based perspective, uh, I'm well versed in Queensland government um, policy, uh, but I can guide people towards um, the state-based, if you are a state-based procurement professional or a state-based security guy, I can guide you towards uh, some of the beautifully written procurement policies that set out to create a uh, a fairer and more equitable um, uh, society. Uh, they've been well written and and sometimes I think their beauty is in their simplicity. Uh, I'd also do to draw your attention to a program in Canada uh, called Connected North. Um, there is a, a fantastic program where, like in Australia, um, First Nations communities are affected by the tyranny of distance and there has been a vendor um, collaborate with the ca Canadian government to create a program called Connected North. And through technology, we are starting to bridge the gap and close that gap of distance between First Nations communities in Canada and, um, and you know, Labrador and British Columbia. And I just think to myself, you know, guys, if, if, if New Zealand can do it and Canada can do it, then why the bloody hell can't we do it? Of course we can. I just think we all need to be um, you know, a little bit more superhero and, and a little bit less, let's just wait for someone else to do it for us. I think we need to, to all step up. So I'm going to, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to stop sharing something and click on something else. Um, cool. Thank you very much for that, Pip. Um, and if there are any questions, please do just throw them in the chat or do throw them in, uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, we do have a little bit of time, but first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you very much, Pip. It's not never easy kind of jumping into a presentation very last minute. Um, so uh, on behalf of Vossa, I'd really like to thank you for that. And I'd like to kind of pick out a point that you made around the paralysis aspect of it. So you, you, you're 100% spot on. Um, the fact that I think a lot of people don't know what, what the right thing to say is or how to go about it so they don't say anything at all. So I mentioned just before your talk that this topic is quite near and dear to my heart because my partner's Indigenous. So, um, you know, she's from uh, the Yugen Bear Nation so on the Gold Coast and around, and around Logan. Um, and, you know, her, her, her father's an elder and, and all that kind of stuff. So he, he's involved quite heavily in the community. So on the paralysis perspective, not everyone's as fortunate as I personally am to just go up to her and ask a question. It might be stupid, and most likely is, but you know, not everyone is, is fortunate enough to go up and have a person on hand, you know, through through which they can ask those types of questions. So, my question to you would be, um, what would be the the appropriate approach, or are there any kind of mechanisms out there that people can ask those questions without feeling a little bit silly, or maybe feel like they are naive? Yeah, oh mate, look, it's a, it's a, it's a, and thank you for the vote of confidence and thank you for the little story. I, I deliberately finished a little bit early so we could have these open discussions. So, um, so, so my go-to guy is Mark Eller, AM. Um, I, 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 uh, I have the ability and, and I'm fortunate enough to, to 
if I have a if I have a uh, a thought process or a thought bubble that I just want to reference check with someone who has. Uh, so Mark Eller, if, if you if members on the call don't know, was the first Indigenous captain of the Wallabies back in the late 70s and, and early 80s um, uh, rugby union. Um, he wrenched the Bledisloe Cup back off the Kiwis uh, in 1981, the first time since 1947. Um, he was inducted into the Rugby Hall of Fame. He retired from rugby union when he was 25. Um, and he played, and the three boys, uh, Ella Boys played in an era where racism was open. Um, and so Mark now is the executive director of SBS uh, um, Sports over the Black Dot, um, NITV. And he's all about creating role models outside of sport because he knows that not everyone is gifted at sport as the Ella family. But to answer your question succinctly, uh, so I'm fortunate like you of having that go-to guy that, that we just ask a question over a, over a phone call and say, mate, is this the right way of framing or is it, or is it not? Um, I think that there's two things that we could probably look at. I think the first one is I, I genuinely believe that there is such a profound uh, sense of ignorance when it comes to these subjects that I think that every organisation needs to invest in cultural sensitivity training. I think that we need to uh, really understand uh, what it is that First Nations people um, bring to the, to, to the sector. That's the first thing. That, that's a formal approach, right, where we educate ourselves to, to break down those, um, that, that ignorance that's up here. The, the next thing uh, is up to the individual. And this is the concept that if we do good, only good will follow, right? So if we are someone that we know, um, I mean, I'm certainly not proposing just going up on you know, to a First Nations man or woman on the street and asking them for their opinion. Um, that's probably not a good idea. But if there is a way that we can we can communicate either through, um, you know, volunteering for, for Indigenous um, organisations. But I think that there's this concept that I think, you know, it's not just Indigenous people. It's, it's men and women in, in wheelchairs, you know, we don't want to skirt around the issue. We don't want people to feel sorry for us. We don't want people to... To, um, to to jump around, just just come out and ask the question. I think if it's coming from a good, if if, if the question itself is coming from a good um, point of view or a, or a, a good um, uh, what's the word good angle, rather than being a, a, a you know a, a malicious question, if it's coming from a, a sense of hey look I, I just want to know I want to be educated I want to learn I don't want to be like everybody else I want to be better can you help me is this the right way of pronouncing Yulgan Bear? Is this the right way of giving an acknowledgement of country? What's the difference between an acknowledgement of country and a welcome to country? These are all things that we should know, Australia should know, like hands down. And it should be taught in school. Oh, I hope to God it is. I'm too old now, 44. But I hope to God it is taught in school. I hope so too. Uh, it wasn't taught when I was going through school and that was a little while ago as well. Um, and a kind of follow-up question as well. Do you, do, you, do you see it improving from your perspective, from what you see? Um, you know, particularly in Queensland, um, do you do you see, you know, it, it actually improving um, from that perspective? Do you see a lot more Indigenous and First Nations actually wanting to get into information technology or cybersecurity, which is even more niche? Yeah. Uh, well, look, um, I won't, I, man. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but um, I see it improving, but very slowly. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm fortunate enough just to, to, to take that veil of ignorance off my head once I started to investigate um, and, and consult like you would with elders. I consult with, with traditional owners from Yulgan Bear and I consult with, you know, the Mark Ellers of the world that represent um, this, this idea about overcoming diversity and, and, and building resilience and never giving up and being a role model for, for Jonathan Thurston. Um, I, I think that we have a long, long way to go. But, you know, someone once wiser than me um, said that if we don't, you know, best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and the second best time is today. And if we don't start today and we've got all of these beautiful policies and procedures in place to support capable Indigenous businesses across a vast array of, 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 of capability, not just technology, then when are we going to start? And that's a question that we need to ask our customers and our vendors and, and resellers and the whole community because it takes a, a village to raise a child. I'm not proposing that Batum can do this on its own because it certainly cannot. But in two years, for us to be able to provide the first Indigenous-supplied scholarship to the University of Queensland, 
in two years, I respectfully lay down the gauntlet to many of my non-Indigenous competitors to say, what are you doing? Definitely. Well, that's the part. I have many more questions. I'm sure other people have, have some questions as well, but we'll kind of run out of the time there. But thank you very much, Pip, and thanks again for, for jumping in very last minute and a fantastic presentation. My pleasure, Lucas. It's lovely to see you, mate.